In this talk and the next two, we're going to briefly have an explore of the process of compilation as it pertains to C++. I'll start this particular one off looking at it quite broadly in terms of the different techniques that are available um, that enable us as programmers to take the, the source code that we write and to turn it into machine instructions, something that actually can be executed on a particular platform. So more broadly, I suppose this is a process known as translation, um, where we are translating from a textual format, the code that we write, into a series of machine instructions that basically correspond to, to whatever it is we have written. And we can then execute that on a platform. Um, C++, as mentioned, uses a process of compilation, but we want to, to really to view that within a broad context of a number of different approaches that we can use uh, by way of translating from source code into machine instructions. At the highest level, we can actually view this as um, a couple of different techniques, though as you'll see as we go through the slides, it is, this is not really a binary decision. There's, there's really a, a spectrum of possibility, and we're drawing a couple of points at either end of the spectrum here. But there's lots of different sort of overlapping techniques in the middle. Um, but it's worthwhile flagging them up because they do hint at or, or get at some of the, the, the key ways we can differentiate between different techniques. So when we think of translation, there's really a couple of different camps or, or, or flavors of translation that are commonly used. One's known as the process of interpretation or to have an interpreted approach. In this particular case, an interpreter works by taking a line, a source code line or a statement that we've written, something that maybe goes up and ends in a semicolon, of then converting that particular statement into a sequence of machine instructions and then executing that statement then and there. So it takes a part of the source code, converts it, executes it. And then that process is repeated. It goes on to the next piece of the source code, takes that, processes it, translates it into machine instructions and executes it. And that process then of taking a bit and executing it repeats cyclically. It differs from compiled uh, approaches. So if you're using compilation in this case, you take all of the source code and you convert all of it into machine code. And it, it's done often in, in a completely separate phase, the actual execution itself. When it's been converted in, you have an executable program and you can run that then as many times as you, you wish. So the main difference there is, is, is how much work is done in terms of taking the source before part or all of that source is then executed. Just by way of then breaking down this to sort of illustrate how, how sort of variable the spectrum is, there are different techniques within this here. Uh, so we'll give you a few more sort of points. Um, the way I described an interpreter is quite close to what was known as a pure interpreter. So in a pure interpreter, it is really dealing with the, the textual, the, the, the characters that are typed in, which is really sort of text and numbers. Uh, so a pure interpreter will take that textual information, convert it into machine instructions, and then execute it. In most cases, the actual expensive bit of doing this is the, the textual analysis, is, is string parsing, is going through understanding what characters that are there, building up um, and, and converting from characters into what are known as lexemes, the components of the language. So if you have a pure interpreter, most likely for a particular statement, you'll spend most of your time dealing with string manipulation and a bit of lexical construction. When you actually work out what it actually does and you implement and execute that, that's generally speaking quite quick to, to happen. Pure interpreters, they're popular uh, within things like browsers or other systems where often you want to be able to, to have a high level control. It's not performance critical, you want to sort of step through things, maybe pause execution, change the code then and there live, and they will be able to carry on running. So it's very flexible in terms of the control that it gives us as programmers to change things on the fly. Uh, the main downside to a pure interpreter is just simply it is slow. Um, if, if you, you would not use a pure interpreter in, in a situation where performance is, is important or critical. Interpreters in general, I, I suppose looking at them a little bit more broadly, um, you, you can introduce in one that's a little less well defined than a pure interpreter. 
In this case, uh, a lot of interpreters work by taking um, the textual information that is available and doing all of the string processing first of all. So they will do initial phase of all of the string processing of going through the things that I've written in and taking what are character strings, which are, are sort of difficult or cumbersome to process, and turning them into um, an equivalent representation. Uh, so it's known here as, as a compact tokenized form. So as opposed to having uh, int, three characters, I, N, T, it would have a uh, second or, or a specific token that says this is an integer data type. And as opposed to having the number, say, 4,357, so you have 4, 3, 5, 7, 4 characters, it would actually just have a data item with that particular number stored within it. So a lot of interpreters, they'll work on the process of having one upfront phase where they do all of their, their string, their lexical parsing. Half of that out of the way, they'll then store the source code in a compact, tokenized form. It's still not machine instructions, and it basically is a one-to-one -one correspondence with, with what was written, but that is much quicker parsed. And you can then give that off to another process, and it can take that compact, tokenized form and turn it into machine instructions, generally in a much quicker way. So an interpreter in this sense is one that, that has an upfront cost in terms of the, the string parsing, but then after that, it's, it's a bit quicker in terms of doing the conversion um, from the, the, lex the, the tokenized form into machine instructions and executing them. Compilers really go to the full extreme then. They say that they're going to do all of the string parsing, going to build all of the lexemes, and are going to convert all of them into machine instructions before we even bother running the thing. So they do everything to end up with an executable before you can then commence execution of that. Uh, often here, that this is not sort of a, just a runtime, it's not done at runtime, it's done as, as a step before runtime, and that gives us opportunities, gives us options. Because we're doing it before we actually run the program, it's maybe the type of thing I'm going to do as a programmer, and I'm not going to give my code to the my, my user until I've got everything fully compiled. What that means then is that if compilation takes an R to happen, it might have an impact on me, but it's not going to necessarily have an impact on my user. Um, so I can take an R to compile it, give it to the user, and they can then run it then and there. Because we separated out the two things, it means then that the, the compiler, the process of compilation, you can look at ways of trying to make it run as fast or have a smaller memory footprint as possible. So there's lots of opportunity here to put an optimization to make sure that the source code that we have gets turned into as efficient a set of machine instructions as we can possibly get. And that's one of the big advantages of a compiled language. Yes, you have to do it up front, and it means you, you have to compile the whole thing before you can run any of it, but that gives you an opportunity to put in really state-of-the-art top range, as good as you're going to get um, code optimization, so the thing runs either as fast or, as, as mentioned, as small a memory footprint as possible. So that's a few points. You actually can blur it even more, and this is where languages like Java and uh, C Sharp and the other sort of Microsoft languages, uh, managed languages, have came in. So it's known as incremental compilers. So incremental compiler, let's say, for example, take Java. If I write some Java code, it gets to be compiled into a class file. So I take my .java file, it gets turned into a class file. Now, inside that class file, it contains Java bytecode. And effectively, bytecode, they are machine instructions, but for a virtual machine. So the way the Java incremental compiler works is it's going to take my Java source, it's going to turn it into machine instructions, but not machine instructions for the thing that I'm running on at this point in time, machine instructions for a virtual machine, a make-believe machine. Um, now, the benefit of doing this is that it's still machine instructions, it's low-level stuff. So we've done a lot of the work and we've converted it down to a level where we're expressing it in terms of machine-level instructions. Now, that's platform independent. A virtual machine is just a virtual machine. It means I can take my bytecode and I can then run it on an Intel processor, or an ARM processor, or whatever type of processor I want to do. And generally speaking, because bytecode's at a low level, it's easy and it's quick to convert bytecode into machine instruction for that particular platform. Um, you can improve it even more so, and, and most Java and, and, and Microsoft ones will do the same, having a just-in-time compiler. 
So if you imagine, for example, we have a, a for loop, we're going to go around maybe say 10 times. The first time I go around it, I've got to take my bytecode uh, and convert it into machine instructions. But I then hold on to that, it's been compiled. So the second time I go around the loop, I don't repeat the process, I make use of the compiled code. So in that sense, it is compiled from reasonably low representation just in time as I need to execute it. And uh, for Java compilers or, or for Microsoft's sort of common intermediate language, things like you know, the ASP.NET or C-sharp.NET, that's the particular approach that those incremental compilers use, where you're, you're kind of mixing uh, both of these different aspects. Execution speed, though, does tend to be a little bit slower because there is a small process of conversion. And because you're doing your compiling whilst the, you're running the thing effectively, it means then that it does have to be fast in terms of the process of conversion. Key takeaways then in this, there is only really a couple of them. There are different ways of converting source code into something that's executable, that's fair enough. And what is the right technique or the best technique does depend on what you want to get out of it. If you want to have something that is flexible, where performance isn't that important, where you want to be able to modify it, you're more towards the pure um, uh, interpreted side. If you want to have something that is cross-platform and reasonably fast, then you're looking at Java and the other sort of managed languages. If performance is really of utmost importance, then you're looking at having a good compiler that'll have a lot of optimizations that'll be targeted for a specific platform.